Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Opportunity Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Elfring, head of marketing here at Empire Flippers. And today I'm talking to a very good friend of mine, Benjamin Golden of goldenweb.net. And he has a great story. So he is a SEO agency owner serving the Shopify ecosystem. And he has a lot of interesting stuff to talk about e-commerce, some stuff that I didn't really know because I'm not too familiar with how e-commerce SEO works. Like I get the basics of it, but not nearly as nuanced as Ben is when it comes to it. But the other thing too, towards the end of this podcast, we're going to be talking about something that Ben did that I think most agency owners fail at doing, which is using the asset that is their agency as a rocket fuel for growth to end up buying or growing a portfolio of other businesses. So towards the end of this podcast, him and I get into that a little bit. Like they just acquired a SaaS business from us not too long ago. That's seen meteoric growth. Not to mention, I think he said he has six or seven other projects that he's working on. And he uses each one of these projects as almost like a client to his agency. And this is something I've told agency owners to do forever because That is like the real power with an agency in my view. Like, yes, you can sell them. They're hard to sell. But if you have a good agency that's doing good work, why not use the talent you build to build your own thing, right? Or buy something and then let your talent go to the moon with it, right? So we get into all that as well as some very good takes on what you can do if you're a Shopify store owner as well as the impact of AI. All right, enough, enough of me rambling. Let's get into my conversation with my buddy, Ben. All right. I am here with my friend, Benjamin Golden. Welcome, my friend. You have been through the gauntlet trying to get on this podcast because a few months ago you reached out wanting to be on. And uh, at the time we had interviewed way too many agency owners. So I wanted to kind of, you know, spread that out a bit more, but you followed up with me again, the power of persistence. Ben, my friend, welcome to the Opportunity Podcast. Tell my audience all about you, where you're at in the world. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's been a while. I haven't slept a few nights. I was busy putting together the strategy, trying to get onto this podcast, but <laughs> let it finally work out. All the gray hairs I've committed to you, but I say like, just give me a few months. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were persistent because you are someone I think is very interesting in the SEO space in general, but give us a brief background on you, man. Yeah, man. So been in the SEO space for about seven, eight years now. Based out of Cyprus, just recently relocated here. Pretty interesting scene out here, actually. Didn't think that that there would be this many like online entrepreneurs and SEOs out here. So yeah, used to live in Georgia for three years before that, kind of where the agency really started doing well and taking off. But yeah, for anyone that doesn't know me, my name is Benjamin, originally from Slovenia and the founder of Golden Web SEO agency, mainly focused on scaling up Shopify brands through organic traffic. And you are uh, Igor Bayesija's arch enemy, right? Yeah, yeah. Igor is actually the, the <laughs> guy that really, really got me into SEO. So, shout oh, out, is shout he? Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to I went to Chiang my SEO uh, in when was it? Like two thousand? I think it was two thousand nineteen. The last one before COVID hit. Yeah, that was his doing. So shout out to him. Oh, that's awesome. I'm a big fan of Igor, man. Him and I, we used to send memes to each other all the time and all the SEO groups and just like confuse people, which is like my favorite form of marketing for Empire Flippers. And then I was in Florence. So right after I proposed to my wife in Venice, we went down to Florence and I was just sitting in the plaza, literally Igor walks over like, hey, like what? (laughs) What are the chances? So him and I like hung out. I think he was with his fiance at the time. But yeah, he's a really good dude. I didn't realize he got you in. I knew you were both from Slovenia. I knew you guys knew each other, but I didn't realize he was kind of the guy, your gateway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of funny because like before I really kind of started getting more and more into SEO, especially like foreign SEO, because like I started out in Slovenia just doing some GMB stuff and local SEO and working with like local business owners too. We were doing Google ads at the time for them. And then I was like, why am I paying for ads if I could just rank these guys for free? And then get the traffic for free. So then I was like, okay, so who runs the SEO game in Slovenia? So I just started Googling around, found the figure. So I just called him and he was like, hey, man, you wanna... <laughs> <laughs> was like, hey, man, you want to grab a coffee sometime? So yeah, that's how, uh, how it all started. Yeah. That's awesome. So let's get into your agency journey because 
you have had pretty momentous growth, I feel, at least, you know, from when I first met you to where you are now, which I think is awesome. So your agency focuses primarily on Shopify stores, e-commerce stores. Was there a reason why you chose that? Because you said you were doing the local stuff. What made you switch to Shopify store owners? And tell me a bit about that clientele in general. Yeah, so it was a very kind of natural transition because like, first of all, okay, I was doing the local SEO, really was just learning back then. It was pretty easy to work in the niche in the Slovenian market because the competition wasn't that high. But then kind of, okay, started learning more about affiliate SEO, went into affiliate SEO, still run, like operate those sites today. And then I just kind of started offering these like affiliate SEO services to like other affiliates because for example, a site got hit and they had a bunch of technical errors and they reach out to me to recover it and fix it up. So we started doing pretty well there and it was, to be honest, it was pretty natural transition over to e-commerce because I mean, I was just thinking who do all these affiliate sites serve? And in 90% of the cases, it was Amazon or some other e-commerce store. So I was like, why am I just kind of limiting my expertise and skill and service to affiliates? So I went into e-commerce SEO and for some reason, we just got very, very warm welcome from the Shopify community. We partnered up with them. The Shopify Plus community on Facebook also pretty much just welcomed us with open arms there. So I just kind of got established there and then I decided let's position ourselves as like Shopify exclusive. And we also just transformed, like changed all of the SOPs and deliverables and the entire process just around Shopify. And just, you know, how you start digging into like kind of an industry more and more and you realize what are the problems that they have and why things aren't working and what are the quick wins that you can implement. So yeah, just been doubling down on that ever since and it's been working out pretty well. I like the observation that the, all these affiliates serve the e-commerce store people, which is true often, right? I'm a big fan of going closer to the source of where the revenue is. Like I tell my affiliate friends all the time, if you build out a big you know, media site that is more of a magazine than your traditional like brochure style affiliate site, you should really look at making your own offers. I mean, there's nothing stopping you, right? Like you could source your own products, your own courses. Like, yes, there's a learning curve and it might be a pain in the butt, but ultimately your margin will go way up. I think by you working with e-commerce store owners versus say affiliate site owners is probably also true, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Would you say the profit for you as an agency owner is much better with the e-commerce people than when you're helping the affiliates? Well, of course the profit, but for me, the main thing is just like, I want to maximize the value that I provide to the market in. And if I'm working with an affiliate side, that's maybe doing, I don't know, 10 or 20 K at the top of the client range. And then I work with, I don't know, an e-commerce company that's doing, I don't know, two to 5 million a month. It's a big difference, not only in the budget yeah. that they will have to invest, but more importantly in the value that I can provide for them. Because if I can raise, I don't know, their organic revenue 10 to 20% month over month, that's going to be a huge difference, right? I provided way more value and I generated a way more cash flow for them than I could have, for example, for a small affiliate site. That is another very astute observation. So when I guide people on buying businesses, and usually people want to start small, like buy a smaller business, which does make sense. But the bigger you go, ironically, the safer the business acquisition usually is. <laughs> like, because it's just, it's more stable, it's stronger. And if you're right. able to increase a business by some tricks, like, you know, a few cool tricks that can growth hack something that increases revenue by 5%. Yeah, you could buy a 100K affiliate site, but increasing a $2 million FBA business by 5% or whatever, obviously the <laughs> multiplication there is much better. Exactly. Talk to me a bit about how e-commerce SEO is different. So this could be pretty educational for me because I actually don't know that much about how e-commerce is done specifically for SEO. I think I probably grasp some of it, but I know it can be a bit different than like the affiliate space, for example. So walk me through what that process looks like for an average Shopify owner. Yeah. So with affiliate, what you would do is you would go into the keyword explorer, do the content plan, and you would, for example, just find all of the keywords that have some sort of commercial or like some sort of intent that would convert down the line into a sale. And while you do the same process for e-commerce SEO as well, in order to not only get the, like to sell the products and to get the opt-ins, but also to 
maybe post some informational posts to establish yourself as the topical authority in the space. With e-commerce SEO, like the biggest advantage that you have over just having like an affiliate site is that you can also target all of those terms that you want to show up with collection pages, with product pages. And this is like, I would say like also one of the biggest things that like an e-commerce store can do. So for example, going to the keyword explorer and let's say that you're selling nail polish, my go-to example, just because it's very easy to explain. So nail polish, you have a bunch of different colors with nail polish, you have purple nail polish, green nail polish, nude nail polish, all of these. And if at the moment you have just nail polish collection, one simple collection, you're missing out on a whole lot of keywords, possibly like hundreds, of, if not thousands of keywords. And what you can do if you have like an e-commerce store, you can just go into Keyword Explorer. You can just filter by keywords that include nail polish, nail gel, nail liquor, any of those, and then have a whole list of keywords with the colors, with different like patterns of nail polish, everything like that. And then what you can do is you can just cluster these keywords. You can see which keywords have collection or product pages ranking for them. And then you can simply build out the collection page on your own Shopify store, right? And most of the time, just because like a typical e-commerce store will just focus on the general collection, just like nail polish or nail gel, most of the time, these keywords are very, very low in competition, right? So it's very easy to rank, but still, because the niche is so big, for example, nail polish, there is hundreds of thousands of searches across all of these keywords that you can target. So this is one of the big differences that really makes a big change to the bottom line as well, just with how well this type of traffic converts. With the collection pages, are they like kind of like a product roundup, like you'd see an affiliate site, or is it structured different? Like, is it like a, just like a category of the actual store featuring those products, yeah. or yeah. how does the page lay out? So with the collection page, you can, I mean, this is a collection page is the typical example that Amazon will always rank with. So it's just a page with a bunch of products that fit into your search term. Right. So for example, gotcha. if we have nail polish collection, we would have a bunch of different nail polishes that maybe are sorted by best selling. Right. So is that type of page, not real content, just a list of products that people can then click through to the product page. So that's another question I have with this, because it does seem like a lot of these product listing pages are thin content, right? So with e-commerce SEO, does content not matter as much or like what role does content play in these kind of pages? Yeah. So unlike with affiliate SEO, like affiliate websites where the content is mainly used to obviously guide the user to the purchase. I mean, same thing you can also do with e-commerce SEO, but again, because you can directly sell the product, we primarily focus on actually ranking the collection and product pages. But we still use the content, but instead of using the content to drive sales, the bigger focus is to use the content to establish the store or the website as topical authority. Because Google will also, for example, just to continue from the nail polish example, if we're trying to rank for all the different nail polish product pages, collection pages, and so on, but we don't have any content covering any of the frequently asked questions about nail polish, it's going to be much more difficult to rank, even if we have very solid link profile. But if we leverage all of the content and we write, for example, 300 or 400 posts answering the frequently asked questions about nail polish, for example, what are the best nail polish colors for tan skin, for, uh, I don't know, for summer, for different kind of things like that, then we're proving to Google that, okay, we're the expert in this field because we have so many content pieces answering questions about this topic. And as a reward, Google will give us the rankings, not only with the content and the info articles, but also with all of the collection and product pages, which are ultimately the money makers. Gotcha. So the collection pages and the product listings kind of act as the money page and all the, I guess, more traditional like blog posts would be supporting articles, pointing their internal links towards that. Cause that's what you really want. Correct. That's the correct. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So when you look at a new Shopify store, I've heard before that Shopify has some pretty bad SEO, like inherent in it. I don't know if that's still true. This is a while ago when I heard that. But when you were looking at a brand new Shopify store or a brand new client that you might onboard, what is usually your process? Like, what is a process that someone listening to this podcast could follow? Like, do this, then this, then this. Yeah, so... We pretty much always start off with just a quick mini audit and a mini audit is done just with the purpose to see if the client would actually be a good fit for kind of the process that we use. 
And with that, we will go through like 10 different quick wins that we lay out. So for example, we will take a look at like how they're linking out to external websites. So are they sending do follow links to every single website, right? Because a lot of times e-commerce sites will link to obviously Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on. And if they have thousands of pages and all these links are do follow, then they're losing out a lot of domain yeah. authority. For example, that would be one of them. Second example, broken links. Do they have a lot of broken backlinks with e-commerce just because they're not, most of the time e-commerce store owners aren't SEOs. So we've seen cases where stores actually have thousands and thousands of DR50 all the way up to DR90 links going to broken pages because maybe they had a limited edition product release that now isn't available anymore and it's just a 404 page, right? So it's not been redirected. So different things like that. If we find a lot of these in the mini audit, we will just start off with a full audit. And I always suggest anyone, if you're serious about your SEO, always start off with a full audit. Literally turn the entire site upside down, everything from on-page, off-page, technical SEO, use crawlers, use hrefs, site audit tools, use any SEO audit tools that you can get your hands on and just find all of the errors and clean them up. Obviously, there are more technical things that we do, just going into the code and things that aren't included in Ahrefs or ScreenFrog or any of these tools that we just kind of identified with Shopify as quick wins. For example, one of them would be adjusting the Shopify URL structure because it's kind of funny. I don't know if you notice, but if you have one product in multiple different collection pages, Shopify by default will actually have different variations of the URL depending on the collection that you use to access that product. And what that creates is just a mess with the crawl budget. You can have, I don't know, 20, 30 different URLs for one product. And yeah, you can have like 10 products and suddenly you have like 3,000 pages, (laughs) depending on the categories. I did not know that. That's uh, pretty bad. (laughs) Yeah, so different things like that. Anyway, the whole point of doing the full audit is to find all of these things and obviously implement the suggestions and leverage the quick wins because... Like I often get asked, like, what's the thing that really makes a difference in SEO or what's my secret sauce? I mean, there is no secret sauce. It's just adding these 1% wins over and over and over again until you have pretty much the perfect foundation. And then you're ready to actually jump into content, into site structure and into link building. Because if you, for example, start doing a bunch of content and links before you clean up all of these issues, you're just going to be missing out on a whole lot of extra ROI just because you don't have the foundation properly set up. Yeah, it's like going running up a mountain without buying like proper shoes. You're just like, let's do it in flip-flops. Yeah, exactly. so you could do it, but it's going to be a bit harder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just, you just don't have like the momentum on your side. It's more more difficult to get results, especially if you have like indexing and crawl budget issues, like that makes it even worse. So yeah, that would be, be kind of the first two steps. And then it's all about just positioning the site as the authority. Obviously, we go through a few steps to make sure, like I mentioned before, to make sure that we're targeting all the different keywords, right? So if they just have a single nail polish collection, we make sure to roll out 50 or 100 different collections and structure that nicely, depending on the niche, of course, depends how many we can roll out. But we just want to make sure that we're going after every single relevant like money keyword that we can. After that, it's a pretty simple process. So we start with a content plan where we export every single keyword that's relevant to the industry to keep using the nail polish example, we will export for the nail polish example, we exported around 300,000 keywords from Ahrefs. We then removed all of the irrelevant keywords, for example, competitors and just different kinds of keywords that weren't a fit for us to write about. And then we use a clustering tool to prepare a content plan and we structure these articles that have been clustered into something called silos. So every silo will have about 10 to 15 articles within the silo. And the whole reason why we do this is for internal linking. So every article inside of a silo will link to all the other articles within that silo. Makes sense. So, uh, and the silo yeah. is basically like a subcategory. Yes. Of like nail polish for goths, whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> That's a example. great keyword if you haven't targeted it. <laughs> I think we might target that on Empire Flippers, give you a little competition. Like, you want to buy some nail polish for gods? Well, first buy a seven-figure affiliate site. (laughs) That's the solution. (laughs) That all makes sense. I'm curious on backlinks. So I have this friend 
he runs a i think it's a e-commerce store with uh, pet supplements i think specifically for dogs yeah. and he was having a really hard time building backlinks towards it because it's just an e-commerce store and then he did and i I'm, feel okay talking about this because he's very open about what he did so this yeah. isn't like hidden secrets or anything but he bought a very nice branded domain i think it was veterinarian.org and created this whole media company around dog supplements at first and then now it's expanded a lot but that got so many backlinks and he used that as a way to power up his e-commerce store, which now the media site is also like leading into all these other interesting business opportunities for him. But I am curious on how backlinking works for Shopify store owners. Like this guy, he's a pretty good SEO and he felt the need to like build this kind of like satellite site to kind of power up his own site. Is that common with e-commerce? Is it harder to build links to a store? So, I mean, with e-commerce, I would say that you actually have an advantage over mm. affiliate sites, for example, if we just compare them, because I would say that nine out of 10 clients that, that come to us will actually have Facebook ads running. Like, so very big spends on Facebook ads and Google ads and so on. And with that, you're always going to get different features in magazines. You're going to get a lot of attention if you're spending 10,000 a day, for example, on Facebook ads. So with that, a lot of the kind of bigger brands that come to us already have very like an existing link profile. We're talking about DR 50, 60. What they don't have is structure, right? So I would say that, yeah, in vast majority, they already have links, although there are clients that come to us that don't have, that don't have links. And in, in those cases, we would just kind of use like a typical link building campaign. I often get the question, like, what kind of links work, still work? And the truth is, all kind of links work. Like, for my personal projects, I get results with anything you want. So, like, 301 redirects, PBNs, niche edits, anything like that. Because, in my opinion, those are still the best, like, budget to results. For bigger, like, e-commerce brands, obviously, because the exit is always in mind and it's not just about cash flow, we prefer and suggest to clients even to mainly rely with like guest posts and niche edits and most importantly like to just leverage their brand so a lot of e-commerce brands just because they have been featured in different like media outlets most of the time what we can do is a very quick and easy kind of outreach campaign where we will just find and identify the brand name that has been listed somewhere and maybe not linked right so we'll just send them an email okay link it here and that's a very easy way to get some extra links in uh, yeah, but other than that, we mainly rely on niche edits, guest posts, and also if a client is doing actively doing collaborations with other brands, which is pro tip if you're running an e-com brand, I think this is one of the best ways to grow. So if you're selling nail polish and another brand is selling, I don't know, for example, is a fashion brand, you can very easily collab and you can have the nail polish company create a nail polish exclusively for the other brand. You promote both these companies to each other's email lists and you're both getting the synergy. And this not only supports the SEO, it also supports all the other channels, right? The retargeting, it supports everything across the board. So just a quick pro tip there. I like that tip. I think a lot of my SEO friends, they get a bit too narrow focus where they all they focus is about the ranking. And like, if you just do, like if you're building a real brand at least, like not like some site you don't like care about, you know, $50 toasters or whatever it is, but like you're building a, <laughs> a real brand, like just by doing the things that a business would do will often bring you the links. Like, so for example, at EF, we have a very high DR and, you know, it started off as a pretty high DR when I first came on board. I think we were like DR 50 or 60. Now we're like inching closer and closer to 80. And all my backlinks I've done is mostly just getting on other people's podcasts nowadays. Cause I did do a lot of guest posts when I first began, but then I got too busy. So podcasts kind of did double duty for me in that sense. And like email swaps, collaborations, like there are so many people in who like have competed with me on guest posts, but they never get as much out of them as me because like my goal isn't the guest post link. Like that's a part of it. But what I really want is how do I get this brand's audience over to me more and more. So like, what else can we do? Yeah. What next? Yeah. So now that's led to multiple guest posts on like the same site, link opportunities with other stuff. Like I've collabed with them on, you know, different conferences now. So yeah, I think that's smart, man. I think a lot of SEO can be taken care of just with like holistic, 
good business practice in a sense. Yeah. Obviously not the and, page structuring because like everyone sucks at that usually. <laughs> That's what like, 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 what is this? Like I was just having a call with this guy. He exited a SaaS business, I think for like $20 million, something like that. He wanted to pick my brain on marketing and like, you're a far better SEO than I am. I would say I'm a, like an intermediate SEO, like maybe lower end intermediate is my content marketing is my real skill and SEO is like a subset. But I was telling him like what he should do with his new startup that he has. And I asked him like, all right, so how good are you with SEO? And he's like, oh, I know enough to be dangerous. Like, okay, cool. So you know things like topical maps, siloing. So like, what's that? Like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, let's back up here a bit. So <laughs> he's like, could you just like write to me how you could do this? Because I started describing him the steps of making one. And he was like, oh, this is so overwhelming, man. I can't write it all down. Like, okay, I'll just send you like a doc on LinkedIn or something. So I did. I wrote him up and it was like a, you know, 2000 word doc. I tried to be exhaustive with it. And he's like, holy fuck. <laughs> so like, this is why SEOs get hired, right? Because like the holistic business side, yeah, that does take care of a lot of your SEO. But then you bring in someone like you. It's like, okay, let's let's go deep. Let's go hard. <laughs> to, uh, I mean, talk, talk to me. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So like I often get asked, like, should I do this thing for SEO? Should I do another thing for SEO? And like... I would say that if you believe that this would look natural, because that's the whole point of SEO, it's not okay doing whatever it takes to get the rankings. Sure, you're going to succeed, but how long are you going to succeed for, right? It's just yeah. a matter of time. So what I would say is really the key to long-term and very successful, like very good SEO results is that you just try to make it look natural, right? That goes for link building, for diversity, for like content, for anchor text selection, right? It's not natural to have 60% of all your links have nail polish anchor, right? It's probably <laughs> Best more nail polish under $100 have. in red. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's probably way more natural to have the brand name as the anchor, right? So that would be like a good piece of advice there as well. Yeah, to just try and just think how it would look in natural sense if you were to get these links naturally. What kind of anchor would there be? So yeah. Yeah. It helps. I was going to ask you, oh, so I remember the question. So with that guy I was talking to last night, the $20 million guy, I've said this to him and to a few other people, and I'm curious on your insights on this as you work closer with these companies' budgets than me. I always tell people like you should really have at least two marketing mechanisms, like two marketing channels, one that is you know fast that you can get feedback quick with, and then one that is slow, but will passively generate like a lot of stuff for you down the line. Obviously, SEO is what I always recommend for the second one. And he was asking me like, well, how much money should I spend on this? And I was like, well, whatever your marketing budget is, typically I like to look at 10 to 20% of your business, of your marketing spend should be spent on SEO or whatever that slow inbound strategy is. Because like, you know, you're not going to get like, payback for a while usually unless you're starting off with a good link profile but you're going to kick yourself in the butt if like a year and a half later you're still addicted to just facebook ads and you never did anything with seo <laughs> and like and your competitors yeah. doing stuff so when you're consulting clients what do you tell them in terms of how they should be allocating their marketing budget yeah it's a difficult question because most of the clients that we get in they will either already have the mindset okay i want to do this or they will be completely anti-SEO. This is, I think you're referring to one of the posts that I made like last week, because like one of, one of the, I had a call with one of our clients and he was like, yeah, I can't believe there's literally like all these like e-com marketers and e-com owners out there that are actually spending millions on paid ad spend, but then to invest, I don't know, 10K a month into SEO, it's way too much, right? And yeah, it kind of led me down this rabbit hole, just, just thinking through it. I mean, with 10K a month, like you can do insane amounts of SEO work for 10K a month. And most of these brands are spending, I don't know, 10K a day on that. Dude, They're literally... I do remember that post, but that's not the reason why I brought that up. But now that you said that, so when I was doing this console, I do these for free for people. If they hit me up, I just enjoy helping. But I showed him like this AppSumo deal for, I think it was for like Neuron Writer. And like, yeah, I mean, it's fine. Like it, it will save you a lot of money. Just buy like two stacks of, of code. It's like, you know, I think it's like 120, 200 bucks or whatever. And I'm talking to a guy who did this big exit and he is freaking out about spending $200 on a one-time purchase. Like, man, <laughs> like, if this is the sweaty startup mindset here, then 
this might not be the channel for you, man. Cause like, you're going to be spending money for a while. Cause his site is brand new too. So his easy wins would probably still take a few months, I would think. But like, yeah, I just think that's so wild to me, man, that people will go spend 10, 50 K a day on an ad, but they won't go spend 5 K a month on SEO. You know, like I have articles at empire flippers that I wrote seven years ago that still bring in deals to us yeah. to this day. Like the ROI on those articles are insane. But yeah. <laughs> I guess it's that short feedback loop that ads gets them so addicted to. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I totally agree. I would say like both are very, very important. I mean, if you're starting a business and you want to get it off the ground, like there's nothing better to do than, than Facebook and Google ads. Like you just you right. need. But as soon as that starts working, like I would say, I don't know. Yeah, like you mentioned, ten to twenty percent of your paid budget spend it on SEO. Just see what happens. Because I mean, at the end of the day, like what else are you going to do with the money? You know, a lot of people like always take the money out. So for example, they have like an active business and then they take the money out and they're looking for, I don't know, a real estate, a this and that. And I'm like, what, why are you taking money out of the business? Your business is literally the best investment that you can make right now. Just reinvest, like, look what you can do. Right. So if Facebook has are working, go into SEO, go into email marketing, optimize every single part of the business, whether that's improving your operations, improving your, I don't know, customer support, whatever it is, just the best investment is usually going to be pouring more money back into the business so that you can just improve the ROI on the back end. One caveat to that, the true best investment is taking the money out of the business to buy another business from us. But yes, in general, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> I'll, I'll deep fake you that. to edit that, to change that, to uh, serve the empire a little bit better. <laughs> I agree. No, I agree, I agree, man. Agree. I tell people like if you want to invest in real estate, you should invest in your business first because like especially an online business is such an asymmetrical bet for growth. Like, yes, it's risky, it's volatile, all that good stuff. But the rewards are also very juicy. Like I've seen people buy businesses from us and double it within you know two years. You cannot double your rent on a real estate property in two years unless you do some real shady stuff like to make that work for you, right? Like, I guess you could turn into Airbnb, but then it's just like a big hassle because you're basically running a yeah. hotel without scale. <laughs> so, sure. yeah, I agree. I think investing in your business makes sense. I just I think it's crazy people don't spend more money on SEO stuff. But let's move back into some of the common mistakes. Obviously, one is spending nothing on SEO, but two is what you're talking about with the site structure. Is there any other common mistakes that you see specifically e-commerce store owners make when it comes to their SEO? Yeah, I would say, I mean, you just, we go back to the basics it would be keyword research, right? And again, like most e-com brand owners, they aren't SEOs, right? And when they're building a site, they're building it for the user and trying to get it up, like just live as fast as possible. And I get that because they obviously they're used to using Facebook and Google ads and they don't really care at that point about SEO. But I would say just like when you're starting out like a new e-commerce business, if you just spend the extra week or two to do the keyword research, at least for the collection pages, to figure out how to properly build it out, the menus and the structure, that would be the biggest thing that you can do because then it's just going to keep compounding, right? The pages are going to settle as you're working on Facebook ads and getting that dialed in. Probably going to be six to 12 months before you get other, like, for example, the Facebook and Google ads dialed in. And all that time, the pages that you have created, optimized for those keywords, are just sitting in Google, right? Naturally collecting links as you're spending money on ads. And they're just naturally going to start to rank. And then it's going to be incredibly easy for when you're ready to actually invest into SEO, just for the agency to come in, do their work, do some quick wins, do some interlinking, and you're going to be on page one if you're not in a very, very competitive niche within a matter of months, usually from what we see. Well, what's your thoughts on content velocity? You know, there's always that great debate, though it seems to have died down a bit nowadays of like, oh, you should publish once a week or the people are like, no, just publish them as soon as you get them so you can start indexing. Where do you fall in that camp? Yeah, I think the conversation died down a bit now because there's AI and everyone believes. Yeah, and everyone's just publishing thousands of articles, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm only all for content velocity. I've been using this approach for years, just publishing as much as we can. I mean, even on the lowest package that we have, we're going to publish at least 10,000 words a month just with art of, of our articles. On the top end, we're doing anywhere from 50 to 100,000 words a month for some clients. So 
I'm all in for content velocity, but I don't ignore links. I believe both provide equal value and that both are important, but I would say that it's easier to succeed just with content than just with links. I agree with that. Yeah. Like I've always been against the weekly drip method. I never saw the value of it. The only value of it I see is like, if your brand has like a real following, like EF has a following, right? Like we should probably put out something that's interesting to that audience once a week, rather than just keep focusing on top of awareness, SEO stuff. Like a lot of the SEO stuff we do is in the background because it's like basic stuff, like how to set up an affiliate website, you know, like that's not a real keyword we use, but an example, like that's interesting to the audience that are getting into our space, but probably not interesting to the audience that we already have. So we're kind of like serving two different sides in that regard. But yeah, I just don't get the, <laughs> like, you should drip out this SEO article like one a week when you can have them all done. My friend who runs the veterinarian.org, he does something that's very interesting. I haven't heard anyone who does this. I think the closest is maybe Nick Jordan from Content Distribution, but he'll map out the entire topic cluster in all the silos and he'll write all the articles. And this is before AI, so it's all human written. So it's like hundreds of articles. And then he publishes them all at once with the interlinking, all done, all that kind of stuff. And then he won't publish again to the next silo. It's just absolutely complete. And his reasoning for doing it that way is like, I just don't want Google to have to crawl my site multiple times to know what I am. So I force them to see, like, look how much of authority I am on this. And it seems to work out really well for him. Do you have any opinion on that? Do you think that's true? We do the exact same thing. Yeah, we do the exact oh, same okay. thing. So before when I was discussing the silos, right? So when we finish up the silos and we have essentially the entire content plan mapped out for the entire niche, right? So for example, if we're in nail polish, sure, like a site will have multiple different niches. For example, if one is nail polish, one can be like nail care and different sub niches, right? But generally for one niche, we will just map out the entire content plan and all of the silos. And then every single month, we'll just write the content. And as soon as we have one silo done, so like one group of articles that are all interlinking to each other, we'll just publish, right? But we never publish a silo unless all of the articles within that silo are finished. So yeah, that's the approach that we take as well. Okay, cool. Well, it's good to hear someone else who is doing something similar because this guy seems wicked successful when I met him at a mastermind, but I hadn't heard anyone doing it exactly like that. Like <laughs> Nick from Content Distribution was telling me, he just publishes all the pages as blank pages and then just like fills them up <laughs> with the content as it gets done. So like, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit messy. <laughs> yeah, okay. I <laughs> but I mean, it's working for us, like, whatever. A thousand ways to skin a cat, you know, but that's cool, man. Let's pivot to AI because I know you have some opinions on this and we might actually have a bit of a differing opinion on it. I'm not sure, but tell me what your thoughts are with AI and SEO and what the impact of that's going to be. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that AI is, I mean, it's going to apply to every single business, but it's not in in the way that like people think. So I like to kind of compare it with like the gold rush, right? It's not everyone that was digging up gold and mining gold and got rich. It was the people selling the shovels. And I think the exact same thing is going to happen here. Everyone seems to be rushing into, I'm going to build the next AI tool. I'm going to build the next this, <laughs> I'm going to build the next that. Versus, ben, I have an idea. Not- Let's build... In AI content, oh, right? Here we go. Never been done before. Never been done. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, for sure, there are going to be businesses that succeed and do well, but that's going to get very, very saturated very, very fast. And I think that the people that will really benefit from AI are going to be the people that have just regular day to day service businesses or any kind of businesses, really, that learn how to integrate AI into their business instead of trying to start the next. I don't know, open AI or whatever. The next close AI. Yeah. <laughs> We're so close, we don't even have an AI. <laughs> yeah. I agree with that 100%, actually. I was reading, I think it was a venture capitalist, I'm forgetting the blog, but he was talking about you can't really invest in AI. It's a race to the bottom for the most part. Google has even come out and said we have like no moat around this, which I don't know if that's totally true. I think that person was a little panicked. Google obviously has a lot of moats. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think regular businesses that use AI are going to succeed massively. Like my writer friends hate it when I say it, but I honestly don't see a reason to ever hire a local writer anymore, like a local SEO writer, for example. Like these content is already good enough. And a lot of like, you know, plumbing in Chicago 
doesn't need like a Hemingway level copywriter because usually those guys are coming like fix my pipes. Is it going to read like your 3000 word yeah. blog post yeah. about the quality of fixing pipes anyways? It's just for Google, right? But yeah, what other thoughts do you have with AI? Yeah, it depends what's your objective. So if you're using the content exclusively just for ranking purposes. So if you don't care about people reading this content, then definitely use AI. For what we're using the content for, which is obviously not only prove that we're the topic of authority, but more importantly to also fill up the funnel of the site of the business through quizzes or through opt-ins and things like that. I don't believe that AI is quite there yet, just because with content, the main point of content is not only to provide some sort of solution to the person, but it's also to make them feel understood, right? So, okay, you have this problem, for example, I don't know, you're trying to lose weight, but you try this and this and this, and this didn't work because of this and this. And this, like to position the content this way, I'm just not seeing AI do this yet. Even ChatGPT4, okay, it's getting much, much better, but still the copywriting and really making the person feel understood, which is ultimately what's going to make them convert, it's not there yet. I'm pretty sure it's going to get there soon, but at the moment it's not there just yet. However, there are, I mean, hundreds of different use cases just for any, like an SEO business alone that you can use for AI. Like what we're using it a lot right now is to just put together different outlines for articles, do quick research and like summarize different articles because I don't know if you're writing a super niche article on a specific topic, you're just going to save the writer a lot of time. So the writer doesn't need to go out and like read through the entire article to understand the TLDR, the point of the article. So we're using it a lot for that. We're using to come up with variations and also for silos, the process that I mentioned before, where every article in the silo will link to all the other articles. We're always using keyword variations in between the articles to provide extra context for Google to understand what a certain page is about. Again, AI is very, very good to not only come up with a variation, but also include the variation in an article, right? So we get an article written and then we ask AI, okay, include these 10 different variations without changing the text into it, right? That way it saves us a bunch of time, right? Because before someone had to go through the text manually, adjust the sentences, it was a like, a whole process that was very annoying. Very grindy, um, yeah. It's one of those SEO grinds that like almost never goes away. <laughs> Someone has to do it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's super annoying when you're like pushing out 700,000 words a month. So it's a huge time server. So these type yeah. of use cases, I would say, are the biggest kind of pros with the AI coming out. I agree with all those points. I think on the point of AI not being there yet for... Uh, like high converting blog posts. I don't know if I fully agree with that. I think if it's raw, I 100% agree with you. But from a human assisted standpoint, like I've been playing around with a few of them. And most of these AI writers are really bad, by the way. So I'm not telling you to go out and like get one. But if you experiment with them or build your own in like OpenAI's playground, like you can come up with some pretty good stuff that needs mostly just light editing, preferably by a person who knows what they're talking about. Because I think that's the thing that, really gets lost with AI, like one, it hallucinates, right? It just makes stuff up very confidently. But the other thing too, is like, if you're a good copywriter that actually knows the niche, then you're able to read this and know like, yes, this is great, lightly edit it and you can publish it. And now that might be a supporting article. Maybe it's not like your big money page and you're spending most of your like actual copywriting juice on that money page. So like, I see it fantastic use cases for content creation, but I agree. I think you and I are in agreement that I think the real power of AI is so much more than just content creation. Like there's For sure. so yeah. many things you can do. And I think the SEOs, they are immediately targeting the thing they hate the most, which is content creation. <laughs> so, like, let's do this. Let's just like push out thousands of articles. I saw this one post where it was like, yeah, I'm pushing out a hundred articles a week with AI in this your money or your life niche. And one of the comments is like, your money in your life at AI, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. I thought it was just so funny. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, closing thoughts on AI? Do you think the doomsayers are right about Google going the way of the dinosaur with AI? Uh, that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. But I would say that everyone's way too paranoid because like, I just don't see, like if you're going to have AI answering every single Google query that someone types in, like Google's just not going to be as usable as it is today. 
which would mean that Google would lose market share, which would mean that Google's stock is going to plummet, which would mean that Google is going to reverse everything. So I think that they're probably going to go through a few iterations and it won't be as bad as it looks like right now, where literally there won't be any search results. But I also think that AI is definitely there to stay, especially in Google search. And I think that the top three search results that are ranking for any different keyword will get even more organic traffic. Because I don't know if you check the layout, but the three search results are positioned at the top, right? Within the actual AI answers. So once again, like if you really establish a topical authority, and if you make Google believe that you're the best possible website to answer a specific question about a topic, I think you're going to get even more traffic instead of less. No, that's great. That's positive news. A lot of my friends are doom and gloom about this and like, I'm not doom and gloom in the short term. Long term, I'm a bit more doom and gloom. Like I think five years from now, there will be a new search engine style that will be as different from today as today is from like the yellow pages back in the late 90s. It will just be a completely different medium at that point. But I think I'm in agreement with you. I think people are way too paranoid. Like (laughs) we had people like they pull out a $400,000 content deal because of AI and it's like, Man, Google's not dying tomorrow. Like, like what are yeah. you doing? Like, why would Google destroy their multi-billion dollar I mean, business? The fear like, of uncertainty, you know? So, I mean, I understand them, but I wouldn't say that it's, wow, it's going to be terrible and all the businesses are going to go down and Google's going to completely change. Yeah. I think it's a bit too crazy, but I really think, yeah, I agree with you. It's going to change. I don't think Google is going to be the same as it is now. and It's going to change for sure. And one of the things that I often think about is, Like when, I don't know, when Apple, for example, decides to really integrate something like ChatGPT within Siri, for example, like voice assistants, like that's really going to be insane. Yeah, that'll be next level, especially with their new Black Mirror device with the VR (laughs) VR device that just came out. We're wrapping up. I do want to get to the something that I think is interesting. I think our audience would find interesting too. So yeah. you start off as an agency owner. You built up all this cred, the street cred. You have a bunch of clients, a bunch of case studies. But now you've moved, not completely, but at least a little bit, you're dipping your toes into the water of investing into other online businesses. So you recently bought a SaaS business from us. Great job, Ben. I will send you a gift card. <laughs> uh, but you bought a pretty sizable SaaS business. So This is a step a lot of my agency owner friends say they want to do, but then they never do, which is like building out their own portfolio of sites or not having to rely on clients as much because they have their own offers. What was it that made you decide to pull the trigger and kind of diversify your business income from just the agency? Yeah. So, I mean, I've been just in the business acquisition space. I mean, first I was building out my own like affiliate websites. Three years ago, I bought a few pretty solid sized uh, finance legion websites. Now the SaaS opportunity came along pretty much what I'm, what I'm doing. Obviously the agency is successful. It does pretty decent cash flow, And I just use that to diversify into other investments, have a bit of real estate, but then again, just does not make much sense to go there with the returns being 10% if you can generate hundreds of percent on the same investment online. So the goal is really, and it. I always really like the presentation that I think I listened to it, I don't know, four or five times in multiple different locations. In Chiang Mai, in Dubai, you did the same one on the S. Oh, mine. <laughs> My presentation. I wasn't expecting Your that. Presentation. that yeah, I, I really, really <laughs> like that concept and I really like, I believe in it. So just the goal is obviously to diversify not only the agency, but just the cash flow into more investments. and. All the businesses that I buy, whether it's, I don't know, content sites, lead generation, if I go into a partnership on e-commerce, if I buy a SaaS business, whatever it might be, I will plug all of them back into the agency. So it's very nice to have like a system that works where I can just acquire a business, plug it into the agency and have the agency scale it. With the SaaS, yeah, so acquired it, I think it was in October, November, the deal went through. And since then, we mainly just, me and my business partner, we just worked on the, mainly the CRO stuff, for example, like just to share a few quick wins, like the business has been around, I think since 2002, something like that. The pricing hasn't changed since 2002. There's no recurring billing. There are 250,000 email addresses that have never been emailed. Just insane quick wins that, yeah, that we've literally just implemented 
Yeah, and, and the business is up. I don't know exactly how much because yeah, it keeps skyrocketing. Last time I checked, it was up 750% in like monthly profits just in the last few weeks since we rolled this update out. And we still have so many things on the roadmap to do. But yeah, I would say like if you have a skill or if you have an agency, just acquire businesses where you have the opportunity to leverage your skill. Increase the multiple, increase the monthly cash flow, and then either keep it if you want the extra cash flow or just sell it off, get the increased multiple and just buy more online businesses. TLDR, the solution to all problems in life is buy online businesses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I am a uh, program to agree with you because my marketing KPIs <laughs> wants everyone to think that. <laughs> a few things on that, man. One, thank you for the compliments on my presentation. I believe you were talking about the asset flywheel that I talked yeah. about a lot. Yeah. And also the fact that you're doing this with an agency, like this is something like I've hammered home so hard to try to get people to understand who run agencies because like agencies are actually a pretty hard business to sell. Unless you get really, really big, you have a, like a lot of management team because it's hard to build a moat and your asset is the people that work for you. But there's no reason why you can't use the agency as your own little incubator and it can still provide money to the agency owner. Like I feel like a lot of agency owners who want to do what you're doing right now, they're like, oh, I'm just too busy with clients. Like, well, start a business and treat it like a client, like have that business go through your agency onboarding process, have your account exec handle that business. And you can also lower uh, turnover because agency owners, you eventually get to a point you might have already gone to, you eventually get to a point where like one of your A stars or key players, like I'm going to start my own agency and it's going to be way better. And then they have to learn all the, like the hard lessons that you just learned. And then eventually they'll have their A players leave. So like I tell people too, like you can just give equity to some of these businesses, to your A players to keep them around, to prevent that turnover. They're like agencies are such a superpower to just like drive massive growth and like fuel for the fire if you use it right for these other assets, I feel. Do you find that's been true with you? Because it sounds like you're doing this. Like, do you think that's true? I mean, yeah, like I would say that all the businesses that I own are built around the agency. Like they wouldn't, sure, I could still scale them, but I'll be on my own, right? I maybe have time for one or two. Now I have obviously the help of my team, the help of all of the processes. The experience that we got from all of the clients that we work with, the connections. I mean, there's just so many different levers that you can pull, whether that's, yeah, the experience of the team, the SOPs that you have, the connections, like all of this is just such a big value add. And honestly, when you're buying a business, that's exactly what you're looking for. The more value that you can add to the business, the more money you make, whether that's in cash flow or potential exit price. Yeah, absolutely. And just the fact that you have the agency already set up, I think agency CEO owners, they have an unfair advantage if they change their mindset a bit. Because like you said, if you're building out a business, you're scaling one business. But if you're an agency owner, not only are you scaling that one business, but you're scaling a bunch of other people's businesses too, right? Yeah. Like, so you get to see all the data, what's working across industries, and you end up becoming kind of like a connoisseur of what works and what doesn't work. I have a friend, he runs a dental agency and he's gotten so good, like knowing exactly what kind of ads work in the local market that when he onboards a client, it takes 30 minutes and all the ads are up and running. <laughs> like he's got it down to such a process where like Amazing. he doesn't even need their Facebook page logins or anything like that. It's just all done in 30 minutes. I asked him once, like, do you ever think about hiring like a salesperson or a you know, a media buyer to help scale this for you. And he's like, I have, but then they would realize how little amount of work I do. And they would probably just go do it themselves. Wow. <laughs> I just think that is great. You know, like, I think that's hilarious, but yeah, man. So what's your future with buying online business? Are you going to continue going? Do you have a, like a big holistic plan of combining all these things together? Or is it more like a hold co situation where you have a diverse portfolio of businesses? I don't know, actually, to be honest with you. So I know that I'm just going to like at the moment, the top priority is the agency. We just brought on a CEO. We're building all of this out, making it just like very, very legit and very high end. Just going to keep doubling down on that. With the other businesses at the moment, I'm building out five or six other projects from zero with a partner that's bringing the capital. So we're doing that and all of those are probably going to be built for an exit within the next year or two. So 
I mean, to answer your question, I'm just going to keep spinning the asset flywheel and see where we where it takes us. <laughs> the empire awaits to help spin the flywheel for you ever faster, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> Let us know yeah, if we can help. Actually, um, yeah, it was a very good experience just like working with you guys on the acquisition. Was the, I think, yeah, it was the first one that I bought from you. Mostly we've been connected for many years before that, but yeah, very, very good experience. So yeah, shout out to you guys. Thanks, man. Uh, that's the way it goes. I remember talking to an attribution tracking software because we always want to know more of what, what's working. But in, in my space, it's very hard because the average time from a person that becomes a subscriber to actually buying or selling a business, it's like 247 days, I think. That number, I think, is a little bit higher now. But it's a long time. I think the yeah. longest you can track with a pixel is 180 days and you have to do some tricky stuff to yeah. get it even that far. So we set up this attribution software and they're like, okay, what's your payment processor? Like, oh, it's a bank wire. Like, oh, haha, ha, funny. No, what's your payment processor? Like, no, literally it's bank wire. It's like, we're an M&A firm. And they're like, oh, well, this isn't going to work for you. Like, great. <laughs> I'm glad we just did this. <laughs> so, like, it's yeah. just so difficult to track, but that's yeah, the nature yeah. of what we Luckily do. Luckily you have the newsletter. Or really, when, I don't know when you launched the new format of the newsletter, kind of like the morning brew format. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that's bringing like a lot of people back to the site constantly to, to just, if nothing else, just re-enter into the pixel, right? Or see the businesses for sale and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one of my ideas because I really like the hustle and morning brew. And I think we switched it two years ago, maybe a little bit over two years ago, but then my content specialist, Craig, he also really liked the idea. Like I originally came up with the idea, but he really made it his own. Yeah. And he executed extremely well. He actually just left the empire to go be a freelancer. So shout out to Craig and taught one of my other content specialists what he was doing there. But yeah, I, like Craig did amazing work on that. Like I think I'm pretty sure it's the largest newsletter now in the industry for our space in particular. But also whenever I go to conferences, I get a lot of compliments. Like this is the only like marketing email I read because it's entertaining and you know educational. Like. Perfect, because that's exactly what we wanted when Craig and I were working on it. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Glad to hear you're a fan. But anyways, man, we're at the last part of the podcast, but I have three rapid fire questions for you. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. What is the best hidden growth opportunities in SEO today? Leveraging quick wins, keyword research, and AI. Learn how to use AI. That would be the biggest one. But don't learn it in the traditional sense. Don't get obsessed with content, but see how it plugs into your processes and how it can scale that. Excellent. What tools or resources would you recommend for people to improve their Shopify SEO? Shopify SEO, I wouldn't recommend any apps that actually go into Shopify because you don't need them. You have everything you need out of from the start. I would say Ahrefs. Just... Watch all their videos, learn how the tool works, just study everything that Ahrefs has to offer. And I think you're going to be pretty much a master at SEO. I'm going to have to shout out Tim Solo that we talked about him on shout this podcast. Him. So <laughs> then he has to listen for an entire hour till we get to the one part where we talked about him. <laughs> like, hey man, they said some stuff about you in this podcast. <laughs> Here's a shout out, but I'm not telling you what it is. <laughs> All right, my final question for you, my friend, and this is the hardest question. So answer it carefully. If you don't answer this well, we might not even publish this episode. It's how important it is. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. What has been your funniest moment since you got into the SEO industry? You know what's funny? To be honest, it's really, really funny. Watching you troll people on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> my trolling is your favorite thing is the funniest thing in the SEO yeah, industry I, I cannot pick one I wouldn't even know like there's things on online or on calls that crack me up every single day like <laughs> the, oh, something recent that happened that happened last week I mean yeah how can I pick one last week like <laughs> so we brought in the Roberto our new head of operations and we were on a client call and you know, like how some pages have this FAQ. Yeah. So he's like, and this client's FAQ section wasn't working and Roberto, he's from Brazil. So he has a little bit of an accent, not my kind of accent, but a little bit of an accent. And he's like telling to the client, you know, your fuck pages don't work. 
Uh, awesome. <laughs> So, man, there are so many things. Yeah, I, I would be selfish if I just said one. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. When it comes to my trolling, there's this one of my favorite trolling things I did was when I first started the YouTube channel for EF, and I was going after all the basic like YouTube SEO keywords, like what is affiliate marketing, right? And I did this like 45 minute video that walks everyone through like step by step, no BS, of how affiliate marketing works with like proper timelines, all that kind of stuff. And I posted it in, I think it was in the proper SEO group. And this one guy who definitely didn't know who I was, he was like commenting about how I'm the scammer that's probably just going to sell you this like $2,000 course. And like, I have never done this, no experience in the industry or anything like that. But instead of like responding back to him, like, dude, I've like helped create 75 millionaires and a lot of them affiliates through our platform at Empire Flippers. Instead, I responded back to him with, I agree. We are all dust in this world. And I just went on this like 500 word rant about this post-apocalyptic poetry infused world oh and God. that I was agreeing with him that he was talking about. And like all my, it was just like so random. And the guy like didn't know how to respond. And then all my SEO friends just like were laughing their asses off. And so the post went like semi-viral with this guy like, oh, this guy's a scammer. And then me talking about the dust of this world. <laughs> So yeah, I have fun, you know. Like, you gotta make business entertaining. I'm just like, whenever there's a joke, like we're laughing at the start of this podcast, and we're both kind of how can I say exaggerating it more and more and more. But sometimes you exaggerate to the point. I'm just like, how does this guy even think of this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Because we're decades of uh, pro experience with awkward humor, <laughs> my favorite kind of humor. <laughs> There was this time in the oil field when I was still working there, I would make jokes and my crew, they would like make fun of me because I often laugh at my own jokes. And so my response is always like, why do you think I'm telling the joke for you? I'm telling the joke because I think it's funny. Like if you laugh, that's a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> See, I just did it there. Anyhow, man, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm glad you kept reaching out to me to come onto the podcast. I'm glad we got this done. If anyone wants to connect with you and pick your brain or maybe even hire you for your SEO services, where should they go to connect with you? Yeah, so if you just go to goldenweb.net, there's my email on there. Or you can reach out to us as well if you're interested in working with us. So everything is on goldenweb.net. Feel free to check us out. And if you have any other questions, just investing, anything outside of SEO, you're more than welcome to email me as well. I'm Benjamin at goldenweb.net. And make sure to send Ben plenty of memes <laughs> for Greg. <laughs> This is from Greg. You just get spammed with like 500 people sending your VMs. I'll set up on respond to forwarding all the emails over to you. This is the real reason why you studied AI, to prevent Greg's trolling in your inbox. <laughs> well, man, it was a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it got you inspired at all the different things that are happening in this industry. And of course, if you just want to buy a highly profitable business, you can always go to empireflippers.com slash marketplace, or maybe you want to make an exit of your highly profitable business, and you could go to empireflippers.com slash sell your site. I've been your host, Greg. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review, give us a like, a follow, share it across social media. Talk to you all soon. See you on the next episode.